Welcome back to the Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Movies You Can Learn From. And uh, today we're going to review the Netflix series, Alexander. And it's a deep dive into the classical times. It's a deep dive into how things worked at the management level and, um, you know, in, in all the wars they had and the uh, uh, successions from king to king and pharaoh to pharaoh and how you got to be in charge. And you know what? When you study this, you learn so much about our current geopolitical situation. So it's a documentary, but it, you know, it's also a docudrama, and there are various historians on it. And today, Rupmati Kandakar, doc, Dr. Rupmati Kandakar, uh, who is also expert in movies and in classics, is going to help us uh, understand Alexander and the movie and uh, understand where Cleopatra fit in this before, during, and after Alexander's life. Okay, so wow. Why don't we hear the story in general as covered by the series, Rupati? Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me on this because it's such a lovely foundation to all our geopolitical talk. This, this happens, this series on Netflix. Again, I'll thank you and then I'll start again <laughs> because a double thank you this deserves. So this is a six-part uh, series on Netflix, and we go back into the ages of 300 BC, okay? And Alexander is a 20-year-old boy Macedonian prince. He's prince to the king of uh, King Philip of Macedonia. And Prince Philip was not such a well-known king. He, was, he came after the Spartans had a, the famous 300 movie that we see that had happened before Philip had come into prominence. And... Uh, you know, uh, Philip has this boy king waiting to succeed him. And uh, when Philip is assassinated on his second wedding uh, reception, you know, Alexander's mother, Olympias, who's a very, very prominent figure in this episodic life of Alexander, she takes charge and pushes him to be the king. And, you know, a 20-year-old has the understanding, the spirituality of that caliber who takes over as the king of Macedon, a small, small king. And Jay, this series is so wonderfully put together because this boy is has become one of the greatest kings ever in the... He's immortalized in the pages of history. And that was what he was seeking. I'll let you know, come on this a little bit later. But when uh, Olympias... Uh, puts her son in the front. She puts divinity in front of him and she calls him that he's the son of Zeus, that is the king, Greek king. And Alexander holds the ambition to conquer the Persian Empire. Now, Jay, we, we are talking of a period where the Americas were not discovered, Asian, uh, you know, we were talking of the civilizations which were there, the Persian civilization, Chinese civilization, the Indian civilization, the Hellenistic Western civilization. And it's a small world. And Alexander is a small entity in this. He's a non-entity. And he wants to be king of Asia. Now, at that point of time, the Persian Empire, Darius II, he's the king of Persia. And he holds a mighty Persian army with the loyalties of every satrap. Satrap is the province that they have. Such a province that even the Egyptian culture, uh, civilization was a satrap of uh, Darius. Now, you can imagine the hold that Darius has and many years that this boy king, Alexander, he wants to come to conquer. He, he sends his generals to fight with him. He thinks it's just a mutiny. He'll catch him at the doorstep. But uh, Jay, Alexander, his greatness is, is in his warfare. He is direct. He is sharp. And he is fearless. You know, every, every, every episode of war that they have shown, he holds one-fourth, one-sixth of the army that faces him. And he is never, he's, he is such a king who has always led from the front. Now, Darius is surrounded and by his troops, but uh, Alexander goes forth. And he is the one who decides the strategy. So, uh, the first war that he has with the Persians, he goes to visit the tomb of Achilles. Achilles and that shows you the spirituality that, that he has. He picks up uh, Achilles' uh, um, what is that? His uh, shield and his uh, jacket and he wants to wear that into uh, the he thinks that, you know, 
he's invoking the gods he's invoking the strength of spirituality and he's taking it on the battlefield when he takes it inside uh you know he's easy to spot on and one at that point of time they've shown that point very nicely historians have uh, seconded that alexander could have died on the battlefield that time because he's prominent and his cletius uh, general he saves so he has a very narrow escape at that moment of time and he wins it jay and uh, he he's the 18 foot pike that the macedonians prince uh, king philip had uh, introduced was and the cavalry that they had the sharp cavalry that they have was such a advantage to the greek side that the persians did not know how to tackle them so this boy king starts from the coast and instead of going head on into uh, persia and that is his central babylon he goes and takes a detour to egypt why why because he is the student of aristotle and j aristotle taught him about cultures and we see that alexander is a king when he enters any culture he he assimilates the culture into him and he puts himself into the culture that we see in that very powerful scene when he's at the doorstep of egypt and his troops are waiting for him to attack and he kneels down before egypt he is not kneeling down before the people he is kneeling down before the greatness of the egyptian culture and alexander himself he knows by taking egypt he would have conquered two civilizations jay the persian civilization and the egyptian civilization the bread basket and the gold provider of the uh, persian empire would be his and egypt i mean any any anything in the world jay has a life <laughs> i believe that so when the egyptian culture saw such a benevolent king it 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 has literally you know hugged him back and made him pharaoh it was a difficult thing for a macedonian king to come and declare himself pharaoh in the egyptian land but that is the egyptian culture welcoming him the egyptian civilization welcoming him and from there onwards he chases the rice that that is so he comes uh to this point where he has to face that is at that point again he goes to siva now siva is in the desert it had uh, you know engulfed and destroyed one king before that but this um, uh, alexander wants to pray and invoke maximum spirituality before he goes towards darius and darius doesn't understand what is happening what is this why is this uh, person not focusing on whatever they think he does the opposite and he is unpredictable but when he goes to this the oracle tells him that he is the son of amun now what his mother had told him that he is the son of zeus a prophecy in egypt declares him as the son of god you know there has to be some connection that his greatness was seen through by the philosophers or by you know aristotle accepting him and teaching him about these stories there is a in a in inherent greatness to alexander and it is shown so there is no get up there is no set up to this uh, series j it's plain and simple but the kind of points that they put forth they they're showing the greatness of the king as an individual the way he deals with darius's wife when he captures her she calls him barbaric but he treats her with respect he he the way the persians were dealing with the women in war was totally different from what uh, alexander was dealing he won her over i mean darius is the king of persia's wife and daughter were with alexander he had won not only the king and his empire he had won over his family so that is a big thing he could have easily treated them as enemies and j one big thing is he was um, he was setting a uh, in a uh, fire to those cities which did not obey him but after he you know uh, comes to egypt from a small village he he builds a city known as alexandria and alexandria is one of the greatest cities of all antiquity which has survived you know the sands of time so this man was not only a architect planner construction how many people do you need to build a city he just visualized his vision was so 
uh, amazing to build a city at the port, which would serve as a knowledge center, which would serve as, you know, um, as a meeting point, you know, center for, it, Alexandria was the center of the ancient world, one of the wonders of the world. So that kind of uh, bringing Macedonian culture into Egyptian and, you know, accepting Egypt as his own land, this is the greatness of a king. And while we are talking of the king, 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 we are seeing that he, on a parallel note, he's also showing himself to be a god. A <laughs> god that what he could do, nobody could have done. The visualizations that he has, the visualizations as a uh, person that he thinks that no, no person would have thought that he can defeat the Persian army. He puts Darius on the run. And when Darius is defeated by his own generals, he gives him a funeral befitting a king. Means he gives importance to dignity, even to the enemy, Jay. And that's what held him very high, Jay. So, <laughs> Alexander was kind of one of the greatest kings. Well, you paint a, a beautiful picture in the sense that here's a, the boy king, and within six years of you know being mm, known as the boy king, uh, he controlled an empire all the way from Greece to uh, the, the border of Pakistan, that is India, as we know it. Um, huge. <laughs> it was even bigger than the Persian Empire that preceded it. Um, yes, but... And he, was, uh, he became famous and revered and powerful. Um, and he had all kinds of new strategies. And you're right. He did the unpredictable. He always faked Darius out, and he had military strategies that Darius couldn't follow. Um, and at the end of the day, he took down the most powerful ruler in the world at the time, that is the ruler of the Persian Empire. But my question to you, with all of that, you know, and looking back at the way things worked in antiquity, the way things worked with these empires and emperors and gods and pharaohs, what have you, was he a nice person? <laughs> Jay, <laughs> the king, when he achieves so much, you know, the achievements make him, uh, to be a nice person, you have to just be kind. And a person can't be kind all the time. There will be, you know, uh, waves of uh, uh, anger and everything. But when you're kind to a maximum extent in your life, I think you are a good person. And I think he has been kind to his enemies in war also outside war you know in um, in ethics he he was ethical he did not and even when he died he he showed to the world put one hand out to show that you go without money and all these things you go without anything so these kind of things which he had he had a very comprehensive aspect of it. he didn't go and destroy cultures when you know you have other kingdoms come in they actually destroy the places of worship have we heard anything where he has destroyed a place of worship and built his own? So that kind of makes him a benevolent king. His soldiers were tired because they wanted, they thought the campaign would end at some time. They did not expect Alexander to get victory on victory and victory on victory to come right across to India. So that was the only roadblock for him was the tiredness of uh, his troops. But as a person himself, I think fantastic. And unless you have a good heart, you're not rewarded with kingship, Jay. Yeah, well, you know, nice guys don't necessarily build the largest empires in the world. Um, but I think he understood about how to deal with his troops. He wrote, as you said, he wrote out front. Um, he, took, yeah. he took chances. And when he spoke to them, he spoke to them personally. Darius didn't do that. Um, it was a new model. He was inventing a new model and dealing with his troops. So they followed him, even though he was outnumbered in so many of those battles, you know, multiple oh. outnumbered. And then finally, you know, when he went to, uh, you know, Egypt uh, and uh, elevated himself or had other people elevated him, however that worked, and became the pharaoh, the god, okay, that was really not consistent with Macedonian Greek culture because uh, oh. the, the ruler wasn't supposed to be a god. Um, but I think, you know, there was a reason for Alexander to make himself a god, and that is that um, that's the way it worked in Egypt. So he was playing, can I use the word propaganda? He was playing <laughs> to the people. 
You know, he did things that he knew would ingratiate the people he needed to ingratiate, whether that be his army, whether it be the Egyptian people, or for that matter, the Persian people. Um, he managed to play to them in such a way so that they respected him and gave him power. Uh, and that was, in, in my view, that was, uh, you know, the signs of his brilliance uh, and the signs of his, his uh, ascending to be this great ruler. In, in only six years, he managed to do this. Now, one thing is of interest, you know, I went and looked it up after the movie. And he had blue eyes and he was blonde. And, and I went to look that up. What happened here? This is a Greek. He's a Greek. He's the son of Philip II. The, the He's a Greek. Why, why does he have blue eyes and blonde hair? Um, it might have been some recessive gene in, in, uh, in, in Philip's uh, lineage, um, but I think it made him special. And people saw him as a, as a physical person that was different, different from the other Greeks. And then he took that from his, uh, his mother, was it Olymp Olympia? She was really a character in the series, wasn't she? She was giving him advice and, you know, helping him become a god. And by the way, <clears throat> Cleopatra did the same thing with her son by Julius Caesar. Uh, Caesarian was his name. Uh, she uh, elevated him. Um, and so what we have with uh, Alexander is that he studied. He was an intellectual. He was ready to do things that the average person, the average general, the average leader wasn't capable of doing. And he understood the value of knowledge, of education, and he capitalized on that all the way through. What a guy. Um, but you know what? I think we should take a little time and just examine how these things play out now. Um, you know, does education mean a lot for a ruler? Does propaganda mean a lot for a ruler? Um, does talking, you know, to the troops, does um, playing to the crowd, does that, does that work the same way? Or is it different? How much can we learn from these experiences in antiquity? You know, and finally, you know, the whole thing about Persia. Now, th this is a Persia between, uh, you know, 300 BC and maybe, I don't know, uh, sometime after that when all this played out. Um, it was not long after that that Alexander was in charge. Um, but you know, the, we, we know about the Persian character. We know that per, the Persians had a huge empire, and we see their character. And we have to back out the whole thing about Muhammad and the Koran and Islam, because Muhammad wasn't born until, you know, 600 years later, in 300 AD somewhere. And the Koran wasn't written for another 300, that is 600 AD. So if we look at the character of the Persians, uh, we need to compare that with how it changed when mm. Islam came around, uh, gee, 600 or 900 years later. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Jay, the Persian Empire was Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian uh, civilization. They had their own religion where they play, prayed to the fire. The fire was their god. So now... Islam comes in this area, so it's like uh, it accumulates, uh, picks up from the neighboring religions. It will do something opposite what Hinduism is doing. It will pick up something what they're seeing from Persia, and they will make it their own. The mosque and the praying style was never what was found in Persia. So uh, there were never mosques in Persia. We don't see them praying five times. There is nothing of that Islamic character anywhere in Persia. The Persians were uh, very close to nature. Uh, because, Jay, any of these empires, these kingdoms were dependent on the nature for their conquests and their accomplishments. So, they, always the gods would be like uh, the god, uh, god, god of Ra, is uh, the sun god in Egypt. They prayed to the sun for or the Nile, you know. They prayed for their agriculture, for their prosperity. These kind of things were the gods. You know, you have uh, uh, Zeus, you have uh, the gods of lightning, you know, thunder like this, something which connects with nature. Muhammad was a prophet and he's known as the son of the God. He was never the God, but he, the Quran that was written, uh, I think it came in much later and it was a more violent uh, version.
version of religion zoroastrian was quite mild and it islam succeeded to overtake and destroy zoroastrianism by the sword <laughs> so they always if you ask any uh, zoroastrian person they will say they were conquered by the sword never by uh -huh. love interesting and that, that that must have changed things um or refined them in some way you know there had to be a a kind of a shift over that in the in the persian character and culture um but, but let me say that um, you know alexander got way east he he came to the end of the persian empire and went further he went into yeah. india and he went yeah. into what is now uh, afghanistan as a matter of fact uh, that's how far he got uh, i don't know if he could hold that territory but he was pretty good at taking it and in fact he established a um, a, a city he did a lot of cities Alexandria in Egypt wasn't the only Alexandria, you know. There were 20 of those scattered around his empire that he built. He, as you said, he was a real builder. One of the yes. cities he's built was called Kandakar. Um, <laughs> Kand and I Kandahar. wondered if Kandahar. any really, could you be a descendant of Alexander? <laughs> Alexander? <laughs> They always, they always misplace the name of Kandahar as Kandahar. That that always happens. Even I, I do that. But uh, Kandahar in Afghanistan. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the series about Alexander. How real is that? It's a it's a docu it's a documentary, but it's also a docudrama, mm. and you bounce yeah. back between a half a dozen historians who are studying antiquity, and and they can tell us what it really means, but then we see it played out on the screen. What did you think of that technique? Was that effective? Was it accurate? How did it affect you? Yeah, that, that point when they're talking of the historians and the archaeologists pitching in with every scene or they're talking of the records that are there, it gives an authenticity to the entire episode, the serial and uh, series. And when you see Alexander, this entire series is focused on the individual change. And every part brings out his character step by step. You see him mature. You see him, uh, you know, you see him bulge in his ambition. And you see him uh, come out with such a, there is a lot of ambition, but it's never arrogant. He just knows that he can do this. There is a willpower rather than arrogance. He has never said, I will be able to do it. There's an aim in him. He is very single-handedly focused he wants to kill Darius and show him that pair to pair to pair they could defeat each other they, he doesn't want somebody to assess he could have easily sent his soldiers behind Darius but he goes behind Darius he wants to have a confrontation and he regrets that he could not have a confrontation and defeat him so you see each part of the series builds on his character and that one scene where you know the Gordia knot uh, which is the knot built by the king of Gordia who, whoever when Alexander comes, instead of untying it, he knocks it off with one sword, a uh, swoosh. So that kind of, um, you know, regal, arist uh, regal, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, creativity. <laughs> creativity. <laughs> in his mind, in his mind, it is never that, can, may, will I be able to do it? It's mine and I did it. It's that kind of rawness in Alexander that is brought out in this series. There is no fancy there is no set. It's just the man that they have shown in this series that is so appealing. And you see the king. You see how Alexander becomes a king. And every maneuver of his is his own jail. And he takes responsibility for himself. He, he leads in warfare. He leads in personal relations. He leads in uh, his friends. Uh, are his. Because when a person becomes king, he may forget his friends. But you see him having loyalty also in every stage. And loyalty you know, towards his... Hmm. He's playing for history. Um, I don't yes. know if you know, but um, Alexander always had his historian with him. Wow. Writing down, writing down what happened. Writing down about the Gordian Knot, uh, which is the stuff of which legend are made. And, and those legends um, are really popular with anyone who hears them. It's, it's, a, it's a great story, you know? 
Um, and the historians wrote down the battles, the locations, the generals. So when you go and look this part up, when you look at, look up Alexander, you find that we have, we the, the world has a huge amount of data about what he did, what he conquered, how he did it, who he consorted with. I mean, it's amazing how much information is available and how many communities and cultures used his name. Yes. Uh, you know, he is everywhere. The, the word, uh, you know, Alexander, it, it just filters through our whole global society. And that's yes. because he had his historians with him and he understood he was playing for, the, for history and he was playing for the, the world. Um, and making himself a legend all the way through all this in six years. I would call that truly amazing. <laughs> truly amazing. Really, I mean, it's a, it's a, really, there's a divinity in his kingship, Jay. Nobody could have done this other than Alexander. And uh, you become a fan of his kingship because the kind of, uh, you know, regality in him, Jay, there is no throne, there is no... Uh, no castle when he sets out. But you see when he is on his horse, he looks like a king. So that is brought out very well in this series. And imagine the real Alexander. There were no trains, there were no drones, there were no <laughs> there was nothing to account for any surety in life. He threw himself to the elements, he walks through the desert, he goes through, he doesn't know the distance he's traveling. He was uh, coming towards India because he knew, he thought of yogis to have immortality. But this man, through his deeds, through his warfare, through his conquest, through his uh, assimilation and mark that he had of Hellenistic Western society on the entire world. Just imagine if, if Alexander would not have been there. The Persian influence on the world would have been much, much more than what we have. The modern Hellenistic Western society international system has a large influence of what Alexander did at that time to conquer the existing uh, map. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have, you know, a Persian map. <laughs> that would have been difficult. Well, when you so, look at this series and when you read up on Alexander and, and, and other Hellenistic uh, characters, um, you find that the names they had um, are still around. People named their children. <laughs> Um, yes. You know, and and uh, their the influence was just huge. Their influence was huge on Rome, and in turn, Rome's influence was huge and is huge today. But you know what? The most most interesting thing about this, and I'm sure you were thinking about it when you watched uh, the series, is about power, about the transfer of power, about the succession of power, um, you know, about... The, the connection between power and military and power and propaganda and power and marriage and, and children, all that. They, they didn't, you're right, they didn't have any money technology and they, and they spent all their time talking about power. Um, and I would say, and see if you agree with me, that <clears throat> although power, we say, corrupts and absolute power often corrupts absolutely, um, I don't think it corrupted him. He was on yes. a mission. He was on a mission. But what can we learn from him? This is really an important discussion. What can we learn from him about power, you know, in the human, in the human condition? Jay, power hungry is uh, one of the greed and wants of man. And the more power that you have, the more that you want. But like you said, Alexander never wanted more power. He went always on the next mission. Next mission. So it was never, I have done enough and I can, he could have easily sat as the king of Persia, Macedonia, and sat in his castle and he didn't need to go back towards India. I mean, that kind of uh, raw power corrupts, but this man had, you know, ambition which was always overpowering his power. <laughs> and the power, uh, the propaganda that he used to put forth was never of uh, a king, a tyrant. There was People didn't be with him for fear. His, his troops didn't support him out of fear. They were like, his mission is our mission, and they used to follow him. When they saw him go on spiritual journeys, Jay, that spiritual journey 
it click it clicks a nerve with you when you're watching the serial because series because um you see that this man is after all human and he is bowing down to the divinity and he seeks his power uh through divinity and he thinks he can he has he's all he he visualizes himself brilliantly as a very powerful entity so that's why when he sees the persian army in front of him he doesn't gauge how powerful the persian army is in his viewpoint he is the ultimate power and that's why he can tear across any the visualization of power within you j i think he was um, the best form of meditation on warfare when he thought of himself as you know in meditation you kind of go towards your inner soul and you bring yourself together this man had the power to bring himself together on the on the field in such a way he thought of himself as over empowering the entire army so that visualization j is just a sign of that's why he is he's immortal in his name because he has done the unthinkable the unimaginable the unattainable and the um, non implementation uh, of plans that a person has he has done on the field on paper we would never have thought that this would have he would have defeated a macedon prince would have defeated the persian empire never yeah, he he understood humanity it wasn't yes. just propaganda and it wasn't just talking to his troops it was appreciating the whole battlefield uh, appreciating what darius's troops were thinking appreciating what what the uh, egyptian people were thinking um, and so he could relate to large number he had an an intuition i would say about what the crowd was thinking and needed from him and that's how he elevated himself whatever the condition was it's interesting when we consider this but let me let me go a step forward <laughs> so we're talking about power and in this country we've had 200 years of uh, democracy um and the democracy is fragile uh, you know there are many people that think it's not going to last that much longer and when you strip off the democracy and the rule of law that we got from britain essentially um and you and you look at the people who are in charge or want to be in charge and i guess trump is a good example of this it's not about the rule of law it's not about democracy it's not about written instruments of you know collective behavior it's about power um, yes. and i think that what we learn from alexander and from this series still is it's still in play it's about people who want power and how do they get it do you agree <laughs> yes jay it's so it's so relevant in today's world isn't it power power everybody seeks power everybody and every leader has to that i don't know the visualization that they have that they have, they can be leaders of this people uh, you know there's a, a philosopher known as frederick nish uh, who talks about the lamb the lion and the child so uh, the lamb is the general public the lion is the one who seeks to be a leader and when you go above that you're a child who enjoys everything and who has the curiosity of a child and the enthusiasm of a child and if that fails you go on to the next one alexander had reached that stage of being a child he had gone across being a lion leader and he had gone to be a child and in today's world i don't think we go across the uh, level of the lamb the you know general society the general term that happens people go for it nobody is visualizing out of the box nobody is thinking of you know what we can seek to give to the community to the society to the world you know it's just power but as it, liberty is at the cost of respecting the liberty of the others same way power is attained by you know respecting the uh, limits of uh, the uh, power that the other adversary holds if you want to conquer him there will be a fr friction but when you come into the zone and you try to um, force yourself like it's happening in all the conflicts that we are seeing we discuss every day um, it becomes a wrong thing unethical and ethics is what is missing now but it was present in the hellenistic time uh, 327 yeah, i agree i agree but i totally agree I, so i have a last question for you very provocative question for you rupmani <laughs> so if alexander 
was alive today, what kind of a president would he make? And should he run? <laughs> I think you and I would go to that country, immigrate to that country if Alexander was president there. But he had ethics and he ruled with logic. We have to not forget that he had Aristotle as his uh, teacher. So we have the Greek philosopher who we still study in political thought. Uh, when we study geopolitics and all, he is, he is a big foundation for all our thinking. And he was his thinker. So imagine the uh, administration that he has, the spirituality that he has, the respect for the other religion. And he, when he lay himself uh, kneeled down in front of this Egyptian civilization, he could have, you know, conquered and hurt. But when you respect something as good as a civilization, it shows your inner uh, goodness, Jay. And I think this president would have stopped all the warfare that we are having right now. If they didn't listen, he would have gone for the sword. The Gordian knot we would need right now to just slash it and stop it because we are having such unethical propaganda and unethical wars here that <laughs> you feel like you need some hero like this, you know. He's not okay, a king. Okay. I'm going to vote for him. I'm going to I'm going to do a write-in vote. No, <laughs> Alexander the Great. <laughs> the making of a god. Uh, Rumani Kandakar joining me in um, the movies you can learn from. And we, we have learned a lot from this discussion about Alexander, the making of a god on Netflix. Thank you so much, Rupani. Thank you for having me, Jay. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha.